now you are online. Okay, now you hear me. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so as I said, uh, non-classical uh, states are, are a resource for quantum information technology, and I will tell you about two, two different ways to uh, create non-classical states that are uh, described in these two papers. The first one is how to create, in a very simple way, a continuous stream of non-classical states in a rather different way than what people have done before. Uh, so it's, it's a waveguide QED setting, so it's a, a qubit in a transmission line that you simply drive continuously. And I'll come into the details uh, later on. The second story is uh, towards continuous variable quantum computing. So it's a 3D cavity coupled to an ancilla qubit where we can make uh, different complex uh, uh, non-classical states in a rather robust and uh, high fidelity way. Uh, so I'll, I'll discuss that in the second half of the talk. Good, so the first uh, the first description, the first uh, uh, story here uh, is uh, really the, the PhD thesis, a uh, part of the PhD thesis of Zhong Lu, uh, uh, who, who graduated uh, 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 almost a year ago. Uh, there are several people involved here, and uh, the, th this idea came out from two theory papers that were made at Chalmers, and then we have now implemented this. And so, so, so that's the background. I may be having some feedback there. Uh, I'll stand here. Good. Uh, so uh, just a, a few words on existing uh, single photon generators. Uh, so the simple, simplest way to create a non-classical state is to, to, to make a, a single photon generator. And uh, within uh, circuit and waveguide QED, uh, I think the first one was done uh, by uh, uh, Andrew Hauck and Rob Sholkov's group in, in 2007, where they essentially coupled the qubit to a, a superconducting resonator. They sent in a pi pulse, they excited the qubit, and then let the qubit, uh, the excitation decay into the cavity that was then released into a transmission line. That was later on uh, refined by, by several groups, uh, including uh, the ETH group. Uh, so uh, the second uh, version here is the one you heard from Denis Vion uh, earlier today. This is Cooper pair tunneling. Uh, so, so by the way, I should say that, uh, of course, this, uh, th all these have different pros and cons, and, and one limitation of the, the first one here is that you're limited by the frequency of the cavity. Uh, so so the, it, you, you're sort of locked to the cavity frequency. Here, uh, uh, if you tunnel a Cooper pair, you can then generate single photons. Uh, and and this is, uh, you can do this in several different ways. And uh, it, it can, in principle, be on demand, even if it's a bit more tricky than, than, than other uh, on-demand sources. It's bright, and it can also do other things like send out entangled pairs and multiple photons. Uh, so a, a drawback with this one, as I see it, Denis would have to, to correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you can make a superposition between zero and one in this case, for instance, which you can in, in many of the other ones. Uh, so then uh, 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 single photon sources were also made in waveguide QED, uh, where you essentially just have a, a qubit that is coupled to two channels. One is strongly coupled and one is weakly coupled and you send a very strong signal to do a pi pulse in the weakly coupled, and then it decays out through the, the strongly coupled port uh, and sends out the photon. This has uh, several advantages. So it, it can, of course, be on demand, so you just pulse it. Uh, it can be frequency tunable, so you're no longer uh, limited by the, by the resonators as you are in these two cases. Um, uh, so the drawback here is maybe that there can be uh, quite some leakage from of the coherent pulse that comes in to excite the qubit. Uh, so that sort of mixes with the single photon. So uh, then in uh, 2016, 
there were two suggestions for how to make other uh, photon sources uh, from, from Chalmers. Uh, and uh, one of them, so, so this one here is to have a, a qubit in front of the end of a transmission line and you can tune the, the, the distance between the atom and the, and the, the end of the transmission line. Uh, and, and this was implemented in Chris Wilson's group uh, at Waterloo. Uh, this is also on demand and it's frequency tunable. Uh, a nice thing here is that this also allows uh, shaping of, of single photons so you can, you can tailor the envelope. Uh, you can also delay the release to also be able to separate the coherent pulse from the, uh, from the, the, uh, the single photon pulse. And here, uh, the one that we uh, also uh, implemented, uh, this builds on having uh, essentially a beam splitter here where you send a coherent signal to the atom and then what's reflected is a coherent signal plus a single photon. Uh, and then you cancel the coherent part through uh, an, uh, the second port of a directional coupler. That allows you to then uh, essentially kill almost all of the coherent pulse so you get a very pure signal out. Uh, that's the, the advantage with this one, which can also then be on demand and, and frequency tunable. So these are all sources, but they're, they're all pulsed. So what I'm gonna show you now is a different kind of source, which is uh, uh, a continuous source. And this goes back to an experiment uh, that we did when Chris Wilson was still at Chalmers in uh, 2011 when we placed uh, a single qubit in an open transmission line and we measure the transmission uh, uh, and, uh, and also the reflection and we could see in the G2 that there was a clear anti-bunching of the reflected field. So, and, and then we thought, how can we, how can we make something, uh, a good device out of this? And, and it took us some time, uh, but, uh, and, and also, uh, can we measure the Wigner function of, of, of this uh, that's coming back? So uh, talking then with the, the, the theory people, uh, they came up with in these two papers here, which has the following suggestion. So uh, instead of having just an open transmission line, you have a, a half infinite transmission line. So you have a qubit up to a, a mirror. Uh, uh, you, uh, also, so, and you send in the signal here, it bounces out here and you, we, we amplify it and then we apply, so, but this is a continuous signal on resonance with the qubit. And then we apply a time filter here. And what they calculated is that if you adjust the amplitude here in a nice way, you can actually get a non-classical state out here, a stream of non-classical states. And the nice thing here is that you can, uh, uh, it's actually the, it's not the sender who decides when, the, when to collect the, the non-classical state, it's the receiver, because it's the, the receiver who can sort of set his time filter whenever he wants. So uh, compared to the previous uh, thing that I showed, the, the, the modifications are that now we have a semi-infinite uh, line, so a mirror, uh, and also we, Draw, we adjust the drive amplitude to null the coherent reflection. I'll show you that on the next slide. And also we have this time filter that we can then uh, also play with, and I'll show that too. So uh, if you look at the reflection from uh, uh, a qubit in front of a mirror, it looks like this. This is plotting the real part and the imaginary part. And you can see that all of the action is in one quadrature, which here I call the real part. Uh, and if you go at really low power, then everything is coherent, re uh, reflected by the atom uh, with this phase here. If you go at very high power, you saturate the, the qubit completely and it's reflected by the mirror, but with the opposite phase. So in the middle here, there's a point where the re coherent reflection from the, from the qubit and from the mirror are equal, but with opposite phase. So you kill the coherent reflection completely and everything that's reflected is incoherently re reflected. And that is, it, it's in this incoherent reflection that you have the non-classical state. So uh, 
what we do is we choose this amplitude, this uh, drive amplitude here so that we kill the coherent reflection completely. Of course, if you think of it, coherent, ref coherent state is of course a classical state, so you want to kill that as much as possible because adding a coherent state to a non-classical state just makes it less uh, non-classical. Then the question is, uh, well, what kind of filter should you use uh, to, to extract this? Because you have to define, since it's a continuous stream, you have to define the time mode of your, uh, uh, of your state. And so we, we, we have checked two different types of filters, uh, just a rectangular boxcar filter and a Gaussian filter. And um, uh, then uh, uh, measuring the quadratures of what comes out, and we use a, a, a TUPA from Lincoln Labs to do that, uh, we can then construct the moments of the, the, the operators A and A dagger. So here are, are these, and knowing these, operators, you can then reconstruct the most likely Wigner function like this, as described in this paper from, from ETH. And uh, so what do we get? I start with the boxcar filter, and I gradually increase here the length of the filter. And you can see that here, uh, as you increase this length of the filter, you get more and more uh, uh, negative Wigner function here. And we can then, uh, instead of plotting all the Wigner functions, we can, def we can uh, extract the, the Wigner log negativity and plot that as a function of the boxcar length. And you can see here that at, at around two, so two here means two times T2, so it's, it's, it's normalized to T2, uh, you have a maximum here uh, of, of this state coming out. And you can see it's not, it's not quite a single photon, it's, it's something else, uh, but the, the, the amount of power in it is, is, is about a photon. Uh, then we go to the, the Gaussian filter, uh, and you see a similar thing that you have also an increasing uh, negativity of the Wigner function. And again, if you look at the, um, at the uh, log negativity, there's also a maximum here around 0.5. Uh, and uh, then you can wonder, well, you could also do a Lorentzian filter or something else, but you can show that the Gaussian filter is actually uh, extremely close, if not the optimal one. Uh, so, uh, so, so, this, so, so this is a very different way to create a non-classical state than just to have a single photon source. So I'll try to point out the differences here, so, um, or the advantages with this. So, so this is a very simple construction. It's a, it's a qubit and it's a transmission line, and you need a directional coupler. Uh, it's tunable in frequency. It has, if you compare it to the pulse sources, it has very high efficiency. So essentially all the power that you send in is uh, used in the non-classical state that comes out. If you pulse a, a, a qubit with a pi pulse, it, typically a pi pulse contains of the order of 100 to 1,000 uh, photons, and you sort of put in much more power than really needed. Uh, uh, also, since we put in so, so little power, there's no, uh, no uh, risk of populating the second excited state. So in, if you have a, a pulsed source, there's a trade-off between having you know, good properties and not populating the second state. Uh, we have a high rate because we don't need for the qubit to, we don't need to wait for the qubit to decay, so we, we just drive it continuously and we can pick out at every time slot we want, uh, which is smaller than our, our, our time filter, uh, we can pick out a, a resource, a, a non-classical uh, non state. Uh, and and, and uh, what I find is interesting and might, might op open for new, th new experiments is that it's the receiver that decides when the, when the uh, non-classical state comes, not the sender. So this opens uh, opportunities. I don't, I don't have a, a, a brilliant idea on this, but I could imagine that if you want to do things like boson sampling with single photon sources, uh, you could use these sources instead and, and do something in a more efficient way. 
So this is really a continuous source of, of Wigner negative states. Good, that was the first part. So I'll march on and, and talk about the second part. So the second part is really part of uh, Marina Kudra's uh, PhD thesis. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of people involved. Uh, and this is also done together with two companies, Intermodulation Products and Quantum Control. It's, uh, this is not yet published, uh, but it's on the archive. So uh, just to, to make the, the, the motivation for why we want to do this, so we, we want to create, in a 3D cavity, we want to create uh, interesting states that you can encode information in. And of course, the, the idea here is that instead of making uh, qubits and, and making uh, logical qubits with the surface uh, codes, etc., cetera, uh, you could do error correction directly on, on the qubit itself before you, you go on and, and try to do some computation on this. Uh, and, and this field has, of course, been, been pioneered by the Yale group. Uh, so uh, a few words on, on uh, previous ways of making uh, interesting states in these uh, cavities. Uh, so uh, the first one was really done by uh, Max Hofheinz when he was at UC Santa Barbara together with uh, Andrew Cleland and, and John Martinez. Sorry. Uh, there they uh, essentially put the qubit into to resonance with the, with the cavity and exchanged uh, excitations with the cavity and bit by bit they built up an arbitrary state. Uh, that was very nice, of course, but if you go to a very large state containing many excitations, that takes a long time. So then uh, the Yale group uh, did uh, this kind of experiment where they use what uh, Michel de Vray calls the Swiss Army knife, uh, using combinations of displacements and snap gates. I'll come back to, to, to explain what those are uh, later on. Uh, but essentially, you send in a coherent uh, uh, signal to the cavity, and then uh, you send in uh, a number of signals to the, uh, to the qubit, and that in that way you can actually uh, create a, a, a non-classical state, which is, is shown here. Uh, uh, so uh, a few years later, they uh, show, show, <coughs> showed another method uh, where they d used full optimal control to, uh, to uh, tailor the two signals, both to the cavity and to the qubit. Uh, uh, and and, and um, so, so that was a, sort of a, an alternative way of doing it, and, and that's a bit faster. And then recently they have also come up with this, where they used the so-called echo conditional displacement to do this, and this was what they used to do the GKP state. Uh, the, the gottesmann kitayev uh, preskill uh, state. Now, uh, what I'm going to uh, show you here is that we have done something which is sort of a mixture of, of these two here. So we, we say that, oh, the displacement is so simple that we can do without optimizing. And then we only optimize uh, with, uh, with optimal control the snap gate. That's in, in, in a few words what, what we're trying to do. So the system we have uh, is a 3D cavity, so it's one of these coaxial cavities with this uh, post here, and, and the, the, the electric field of this post oscillates then uh, in this cavity, and that gives a very high Q value. And uh, then you can stick in a chip here, and we put in one uh, made of silicon uh, with a, a transmon qubit and a readout resonator. And here are the numbers for the for the qubit and the cavity. So you see the frequencies, the readout resonator is at 7.2 gigahertz, the, uh, uh, the qubit is at 6.2, and then the cavity is at 4.5. And uh, the qubit has de decent coherence, uh, 30 to 40 microseconds, and the, the cavity is about 10 times more long-lived. Oh, so uh, since, uh, since a few years, we've developed a method how to make really high Q cavities. Uh, so by doing, uh, so you see if you just machine the cavity, 
it has a big spread in the Q value from, say, uh, 8 million to up to 80 million. Uh, but if you then first etch it and then anneal it, you see this green crowd here. You can get all of the cavities, uh, and we tested quite a few, to, uh, to what, all of them above 60 million. So that's sort of a reproducible way of really making good, uh, good uh, cavities. Of course, once you stick in your silicon chip, it's going to go down a bit. But it's always good to start with a good, uh, good cavity. So, uh, so how do we do this then? Well, uh, so we, we do it uh, very similar to, to what, uh, what the Yale group did first. Uh, we define a target state that we want to do. And then uh, we optimi optimize a sequence of displacements, snaps, displacements, snaps, displacements. And uh, so first you choose how many snaps you want to do. And uh, in our case, it's two or three, so it's not very many. Uh, but then you can optimize for these, these uh, how big the displacements are, so the, how big the alphas are, and then how big the, the angles are uh, on, uh, on the different Fox states. I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. So once you know these, these, uh, these angles, then uh, you take this, this angle and then you put in the Hamiltonian parameters into a, a software that has been developed by this company, Q-Control. And that lets you calculate optimum microwave pulses, the I and the Q, the two quadratures of the microwave pulse. Uh, uh, and we use then the, 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 uh, the hardware from intermodulation products to, to play up these, uh, these signals. And in that way, you can shorten the, the the length of this snap gate from uh, several microseconds to half a microsecond. So there's an improvement in time doing this. Uh, and then, of course, we apply the sequence. And finally, we measure the Wigner function. So uh, this is done in the strongly dispersive regime. Uh, uh, so, and that means that we can resolve the photon uh, Fock numbers. So if you're, if if you uh, do spectroscopy on the qubit and the cavity is empty, you see just a single spectral line. But if you go to, uh, uh, if you fill up the cavity with, in this case, 1.8 photons, then you are in fact see the, the different Fox states, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, so each of these peaks corresponds to the, the cavity having a, a well-defined Fock, Fock number. And uh, the distance here, so this is resolved. So this is uh, three, 3 megahertz between these peaks here. And so normally what you would do in a snap is you would send in a signal on each of these. So you would send in a frequency comb. But you would have to have it long enough so that in frequency space uh, it would be more narrow than the distance between those two. And that limits the time of this. Uh, but so what we do instead is we do this optimal control, and then we can do it faster. So uh, just uh, uh, what are the displacement and the snaps? The displacement is rather obvious, uh, but uh, you get some intuition if you look at the Fock number, so you start with vacuum. Uh, so this is the Wigner uh, function, and this is the, the probability of, of the different Fock states. Uh, then you, uh, if you displace, you send in a coherent state to the cavity. Of course, then you displace the vacuum, and you start to populate the cavity with the Poissonian distribution. Uh, and uh, sorry, and, and yeah, so and then you can you can displace it, of course, with a different phase, and and then you fill up more uh, photons in the in the uh, in the different Fock numbers. And uh, so what is a snap? So a snap is when you, for a given uh, Fox state, add a phase uh, that you can control. And the way you do that is you go from the ground state of the qubit to the excited state with the pi pulse. And then you directly afterwards put in another pi pulse, but you rotate the phase. And that means you're, you're covering this blue area here, which adds an, a berry phase to this Fock number here. 
Uh, and since you can, of course, change the face as you like, you can then change this face uh, as you like. And uh, uh, so, so the way you do it here, first you make a displacement like this. Then uh, you do this uh, face angle. And uh, then directly you get something that looks like a displaced Fox state. Uh, uh, I, so if this phase here is pi, and you see that the population of the of the the Fock numbers has not changed, the only thing is that you have changed the phase of the of the zero of the vacuum. Uh, so uh, an example how to do the the single photon Fock state here is you start by displacing. So you populate a, a, a certain number of the Fock states here. You then uh, do the uh, uh, do this phase control, you get this uh, uh, displaced Fox state, and then you displace it back by another amount, and then you see that you have only the, the single photon Fox state uh, uh, occupied. So it's a very simple way of, of creating uh, a Fox state. Now, uh, so uh, to summarize, what we do is we, uh, we have the cavity, we have the qubit, and we have the readout. We do the sequence of displacement, snap, displacement, snap, and so on, and then we stop with the displacement. And then we have our state, so this is the state preparation. And then we, uh, d we do the Wigner tomography, which you do by first displacing, and then doing a Ramsey uh, on the qubit, which is exactly 1 over 2 chi. Uh, and if, when you then measure, you get the value for this alpha in the Wigner function. And then you just map out with different alphas over the complex plane, and then you have the Wigner function. Of course, it takes quite a long time because you have to, you have to do this over the full, full, uh, full plane. But this, this is what we do. And so now we come to the results. What, uh, what did we achieve? So uh, with two snap gates and three displacements, uh, with an overall time of 1.15 microseconds. Uh, we generated all these three states, which all have an average number of two photons. The two photon Fox state, a binomial state, the superposition between zero and four, and also a uh, uh, Schrodinger's cat state, uh, alpha minus minus alpha. And you can see that we have decent uh, fidelities here uh, of the order of, of 94 to 99 uh, percent fidelity. Now we also want to do more uh, complex uh, uh, states, and, and that we do here. So we can do the GKP state with three snaps and four displacements. Uh, and also we can do this cubic phase state, uh, uh, which is, uh, is thought to be a, a good resource for, for uh, continuous variable quantum computing. I know it's a bit debated. Uh, uh, in the literature, uh, how useful it is, but let's see, now we've made it. So, uh, and to, to our knowledge, this is the first uh, time anyone has made it. Uh, and so here the fidelities are uh, a bit lower, uh, but uh, uh, the reason is of course that then we have to include more, uh, a, a larger Fox space. So for the GKP, we actually go to the 17th uh, Fox state. Good, and uh, um, another uh, advantage with this is that uh, since you do this in sequence, you can actually, after each of these operations, you can go in and do the Wigner function and check that re it really happened what you thought it happened. So you can check then, and of course you can solve the master equation and see what it should be in theory, and you see that it agrees quite well on these steps. So, so we can assign fidelities to each of these steps then and see which one is sort of the difficult one. Uh, the last thing here is that we can also then uh, show that this is a robust method. So uh, we can vary different parameters. So uh, the dispersive shift that we stick into the, the optimizer, we can change. We can change the amplitude of the displacement, and we can also change the frequency and the amplitude of the snap gate. And you see here on this side here that we have done that, and, and uh, uh, we have good agreement on how it varies with these parameters. So the red is the, 
the theoretical calculation and the black is the, the measurement. And you can then also compare that to what our simulations say if we would use a standard SNAP. And what you see is that uh, our, our method is substantially more robust in terms of, of uh, variations in the parameters. Uh, so to, to summarize, we've been able to do high fidelity uh, Wigner negative states uh, using uh, snaps and displacements. Uh, we have optimized uh, uh, pulse, pulses to speed up the snap gates by four to eight times. And uh, we've shown that these uh, pulses are, are uh, quite robust. And with this, I thank you for your attention. And I also want to say that we have postdoc positions announced at our, our homepage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pep, for this nice presentation. Uh, we have time for some questions. Thank you for the nice talk. Maybe I'm rather confused. The photon number distribution is actually Poissonian. Is there any traces of a non-Poissonian distribution? I, I guess I, I observed uh, some. So, yeah, so uh, uh, when you send in a coherent state, of course, it's Poissonian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But when, once you have made these states, it's definitely non-Poissonian. Uh, ah, okay, non okay. No, no, I understood so that let's say it was Poissonian. Yeah, okay. yeah. May I come here? Hi, uh, nice talk. Um, I noticed that sometimes your experiment fidelity is better than the theory one. Yes. <laughs> uh, is it because of the uncertainties or? Yeah. Uh, so, so we have uh, thought about that uh, quite a lot. If if I go if I go back to the, the slide with that. So there's a uh, in in two cases. So here you see our Fox state two is actually uh, a bit better than our theory, and also the, uh, uh, the here the DKP state is is one percent better. So first of all, I should say that the uncertainty of our uh, fidelity is about one percent. Uh, uh, but the, it's also so you know that this the, the 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 estimate of how good it is is based on the. T1 and T2, and as we know, T1 and T2 fluctuates. So what we think is happening is that, you know, in some cases we were lucky and that uh, T1 was a bit longer than, than the average that we have measured. Because the numbers we put in is, is of course the average, but we know that there's quite a, a spread around that. So th that's the explanation we have. Uh, I, I think that's the case, but I'm, I cannot uh, be completely sure. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, I have a question about the first technique that you used. I, if you go to the Wigner... Yeah, things like that, maybe the, the previous ones or whatever. They, they look... Uh, well, of course, there's some asymmetry, but even if, if, you, if you remove that in your head, they look like they have also displaced um, Fox states. Do you know if the direction of the displacement has anything to do with the original coherent state that you um, that you use? We have not checked that, so I I, I cannot say. So we, you know. Uh, this is, of course, not an ordinary Fox state because, for one thing, the time envelope of it is, is very different. But it also, there is this asymmetry that here you see that the, the negative part is, is below the center of the red part. Um, and uh, I, I don't really have an intuition what that means in terms, if, if you can identify that with, with uh, you know, uh, some certain superposition of, of, of some states. But... Uh, yeah, if you have some input, I'll be happy to. <laughs> so another last question here. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering about actually two things. Is that 
you described that you completely cancel the coherent part, but is that, have you actually measured that that gives you then the highest WLN or could, could it okay. still a little bit optimize the power to get a little bit more negativity? So, so, so here I should be clear that, uh, so, so this, so, so you mean that this is, uh, that we're right at this point. Right. That, yes. So we optimize that quite okay. carefully because it's, it's rather sensitive on that. So, uh, okay. And then, then is the G2, how does the G2 look like for the, the states you made? Okay. So we have not measured G2 for the, for these states. No. Okay. But, but they should be substantially better than 0.5 as we had before. Ah, there's a good slow line. But, but it should be substantially better uh, because this qubit had much better <laughs> coherence than the, than the one we had um, 10 years ago. Have a question as, as well. Uh, Hakan, do you like tea? Yes, yes, this is Hakan. Um, uh, thank you for taking my question. I, I was wondering um, this um, this fidelity that was stated for theory. What, what does theory mean there, and what does um, fidelity of theory mean? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it means that uh, this optimization, when you, you have your target state, that is the one we're trying to make. But even if you optimize the, the displacements and the angles, uh, the, the state you get is not exactly the target state. And it's fidelity of that, uh, that state, uh, but including the decoherence of the qubit that we say is the theory. Does that take into account the measurement chain or, or you know, the amplifiers in, in the line? Uh, no, it doesn't, but the noise there is, is quite small. Uh, we have, so we have a, a, a tufa, uh, and uh, we average a lot. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's not the, that's not the, the main contribution. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's thank uh, Perry again.